Good morning, Michael here, and um, trying to wake up here. It's uh, 4:21 a.m. and today, looking at uh, Psalm 17 again, focusing on verse 7 through to 10. So let's go ahead and read those four verses. Verse 7. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Verse 8. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. Verse 10. They close their hearts to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. And so we look at the Treasure of David for the exposition as written by Charles Spurgeon. Verse 7. Sure thy marvelous loving kindness. Marvelous in its antiquity, its distinguishing character, its faithfulness, its immutability, and above all, marvelous in the wonders which it works. That marvelous grace which has redeemed us with the precious blood of God's only begotten is here invoked to come to the rescue. The grace is sometimes hidden, the text says, show it. Present enjoyments of divine love are matchless cordials to support fainting hearts. Believer, what a prayer is this. Consider it well. O Lord, show thy marvelous love and kindness. Show it to my intellect and remove my ignorance. Show it to my heart and revive my gratitude. Show it to my faith and renew my confidence. Show it to my experience and deliver me from all my fears. The original word here used is the same which is Psalms 4, 3 is rendered set apart and it has the force of distinguishing thy mercies. Set them out and set apart the choices to be bestowed upon me in this hour of my severest afflictions. O thou that service by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. The title here given to our gracious God is eminently consolatory. He is the God of salvation. It is his present and perpetual habit to save believers. He puts forth his best and most glorious strength, using his right hand of wisdom and might to save all those of whatsoever rank or class who trust themselves with him. Happy faith thus to secure the omnipotent protection of heaven. Blessed God, to be thus gracious to unworthy mortals when they have but grace to rely upon thee. The right hand of God is interposed between the saints and all harm. God is never at a loss for means. His own bare hands is enough. He works without tool as well as with them. Verse 8 Keep me as the apple of the eye. The eye. No part of the body more precious, more tender, and more carefully guarded than the eye. And of the eye, no portion more peculiarly to be protested than the central apple, the pupil, or as the Hebrew calls it, the daughter of the eye. The all-wise creator has placed the eye in a well-protected position. It stands surrounded by projecting bones like Jerusalem encircled by mountains. Moreover, its great author has surrounded it with many tunics of inward covering, besides the hedge of the eyebrow, the curtain of the eyelids, and the fence of the eyelashes. And in addition to this, 
he has given to every man so high a value for his eyes and so quick an apprehension of danger that no member of the body is more faithfully cared for than the organs of sight. Thus, Lord, keep thou me, for I trust I am one with Jesus, and so a member of his mystical body. Hide me under the shadows of thy wings, even as a parent bird completely shields her brood from evil, and meanwhile cherishes them with the warmth of her own heart. By covering them with her wings, so do thou with me, most condescending God. For I am thine offspring, and thou hast a parent's love in perfection. The last clause is in the Hebrew, in the future tense, as if to show that what the writer had asked for, but a moment before he was now sure, would be granted to him. Confident expectation should keep pace with earnest supplications. Verse 9 From the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. The foes from whom David sought to be rescued were wicked men. It is hopeful for us when our enemies are God's enemies. They were deadly enemies whom nothing but his death would satisfy. The foes of a believer's soul are mortal foes, most emphatically, for they who war against our faith aim at the very life of our life. Deadly sins are deadly enemies, and what a sin is there which hath not death in its powers. These foes oppressed David, they laid his spirit waste, as invading armies ravage a country, or as wild beasts desolate a land. He likens himself to a besieged city, and complained that his foes come pass him about. It may well quicken our business upward, when all around us every road is blocked by deadly foes. This is our daily position, for all around us dangers and sins are lurking. O oh God, do thou protect us from them all. Verse 10 They are enclosed in their own fat. Luxury and gluttony beget vainglorious fatness of heart, which shuts up in its gates against all compassionate emotions and reasonable judgments. The old proverb says that full bellies make empty skulls, and it's yet more true that they are frequently make empty hearts. The rankest weeds grow out of the fattest soil. Riches and self-indulgence are the fuel upon which some sins feed their flames. Pride and fullness of bread were Solomon's twin sins. Ezekiel 16.49 Fed hawks forget their masters, and the moon of its fullness is furthest from the sun. Eglon was a notable instance that a well-fed corporation is no security to life when a sharp message comes from God addressed to the inward vitals of the body. With their mouth, they speak proudly. He who adores himself will have no heart to adore the Lord. Full of selfish pleasures within his heart, the wicked man fills his mouth with boastful and arrogant expressions. Prosperity and vanity often lodge together. Woe to the fed ox when it bellows at its owner. The polyax is not far off. <laughs> Oy. Uh, <laughs> Indeed. Woe to the fed ox when it bellows at its, at its owner. The Polax is not far off. <laughs> oh, trust you enjoyed this uh, meditation. Michael here declaring yet again, Jesus is Lord. Until next time, be blessed.